All right, let's look at cycloalkanes. So unlike uh, acyclic or non-cyclic molecules, cycloalkanes have a ring shape. So we've got the uh, hydrocarbon has joined back on itself to make a ring. Now they have, because of that ring structure, they have much less conformational freedom. Remember conformers, we have rotation around single bonds. And so if we put things into a ring, then we don't get the opportunity to rotate around bonds because it would lead to breaking open of that ring. Breaking a single bond between carbon atoms is quite difficult to do. Um, so cycloalkanes can have as little as three um, carbon atoms, cyclopropane. That's the smallest. Obviously, less than three, we can't have a ring. Um, and they can have more than 30 carbon atoms. In fact, many more than 30. So uh, don't worry about the name of this compound, cyclotriacontane, but that's, uh, that's the name for a 30 carbon um, cyclic hydrocarbon. So small rings, five carbon atoms or less, are quite strained um, because the bond angles around that system are less than the ideal 109.5 degrees that we would like for an sp3 hybridized carbon atom. So cyclopropane is very strained. Cyclobutane is also quite strained. Cyclopentane is not too bad, whereas cyclohexane, the six carbon system, is actually uh, pretty good. Um, so all of the ring systems that are larger than three atoms are actually not flat. So that we may draw them flat, but they're actually three-dimensional in shape. And uh, that's something to bear in mind when you're thinking about these. So the cyclic alkanes can assume this non-planar conformation, and that's to maximize the uh, bond angles, so they can minimize the angle strain that's involved in not getting that 109.5 degrees. And also something called torsional strain. So uh, the ring puckers to get rid of uh, interactions that are energetically unfavorable. Large rings have got a lot more possible conformations available to them uh, than smaller rings, and they're much more difficult to analyze. And we normally um, would need to uh, approach those using computational chemistry because um, there's so many possible ways that you could get those ring, uh, those atoms at a ring um, once they get above about a, a size of about um, seven or eight carbon atoms. So interestingly, the strain in a three-membered ring, cyclopropane, is not that much different to the strain in a four-membered ring. And that's largely because of the fact that even though the bond angles are a bit better in a four-membered ring than a three-membered ring, there's now four carbon atoms that are um, involved in bonding arrangements that aren't ideal. So it's just a ma matter of numbers. Now, cyclopentane, though, the five-membered ring, is actually really close to the ideal bond angles. It's only 108 degrees rather than 109.5. And so um, it actually has relatively little ring strain compared to the three and the four-membered rings. Now, cyclohexane, we'll cover this in a moment, but it doesn't have 120 degree bond angles because it's not flat. It's able to pucker itself into a three-dimensional shape that actually gets much better bond angles than this uh, flat drawing would imply. So actually the six-membered ring system, cyclohexane, has no uh, ring strain. It's actually perfectly stable. Then we get this odd bunch from 7 through to 13 where we get some ring strain back. And that's because the system can pucker, but it can't get to that ideal kind of arrangement that it can in a six-membered ring. So seven's not bad, pretty similar to five-membered rings. It gets worse from eight to nine to 10 to 11. 12 is an odd one, it's actually not too bad. 13 is a little bit worse. And then 14 and bigger, really those are large ring systems. They have so many possible arrangements of those atoms that they can find a way to uh, have fairly ideal or close to ideal bond angles and not much uh, ring strain. So over here we've got um, a three-dimensional um, model of what cyclopentane looks like. So it has what's called an envelope uh, type uh, conformation. Okay, so um, we said that cyclic systems, they can't, they don't have as much freedom to undergo conformational change as uh, acyclic systems, but they, they can move. So they can, um, uh, they can exist in a variety of different conformational isomers. So cyclohexane has two major sort of conformations, both allowing 109.5 degree bond angles. 
The first one we, one that we, talk, we will talk about is called a chair conformation. And it's the most thermodynamically stable form of the two. So thermodynamically stable means it's the lowest in energy. The other form that gets these 109.5 degree bond angles is known as the boat form. And it's not as thermodynamically favorable. So the, the chair form of cyclohexane looks like this. If we draw it out in a sort of pseudo three-dimensional arrangement, we try to give it a perspective drawing, it looks like this. And you can see, hopefully you can see why we call it a chair. It's a, almost a bit like a, a lounge chair or a deck chair. It sort of has that folding kind of look to it. We can also draw with the hydrogens drawn in. And we find that when we've drawn the hydrogens in, we can see there's two different types of hydrogen around this ring. The orange ones here are what we call axial hydrogens. Because if you imagine there's an axis going through the middle of the molecule here where we can spin that ring system around, those hydrogens are long, lie along that axis. And then we have these equatorial hydrogens in green, which are on the equator of that ring system. So they're around the edges here. So that's the chair conformation. We can look at that from a variety of different angles. Although I really recommend looking at this with a uh, molecular model. It gives you a great feel for the three-dimensional uh, nature of this ring. The boat conformation, um, we basically get one of these ends of the deck chair and push it up or push it down so that the two ends are close together. So those two ends now are sort of lying above the plane of the rest of the molecule. And the thing about the boat conformation is that although it has those 109.5 degree bond angles, which is good, it has some um, interaction between these hydrons here. So they only go through what's called steric interactions. And that's a negative thing, and we don't want that to occur. And so this is an unfavorable arrangement. And so the boat conformation is less thermodynamically stable than the uh, chair conformation. So these two conformations, they can interconvert via even less stable conformations. So uh, we can have the chair converting to the boat and back, but most of the molecule will be existing any point in time as the chair because it's more um, energetically stable. Now, the substituents around that cyclohexane, if it's substituted, can occupy either those axial or, or equatorial positions. So... Um, Here's another depiction of that, the red ones being axial and the blue ones being equatorial. So they prefer to adopt these equatorial positions to reduce repulsions between axial groups. So we have what's called 1,3 diaxial repulsion between axial substituents on a um, cyclohexane ring. So you can see the red groups here are close to each other, and if they're large, they're going to repel each other. Now, in cyclohexane itself, um, there's three above and three hydrons below the ring, um, but hydrons are quite small. So, although there's some repulsion, it's not a, a big problem, and it doesn't. The ring system doesn't have any other choice. But if we start putting groups here uh, that are bigger than hydrogen, then this becomes a much more important interaction. Okay, so cycloalkanes, we need to look at how to name these. Um, and really, it's very similar to naming the uh, non-cyclic um, alkanes. So uh, here we've got a four-membered ring uh, with an alkyl chain attached to it. We can uh, draw that as a Kekulé structure like this, or sort of a partial Kekulé structure. And then below that is the full Kekulé line bond structure. And then we can name this system. So there's two ways of naming this. And really, we could do either one. Um, it can either be a cyclobutyl group attached to a hexane, so it's one cyclobutyl hexane to show that the uh, cyclobutyl group is in uh, is attached to the hexane at the one position of that hexane chain, or it's a hexyl cyclobutane. And now this one doesn't need a number because the cyclobutane, no matter where we put the hexyl group, uh, it's always there's only one substituent on that ring. And because the ring is symmetrical, then we don't need a number. Okay, so let's look at a multiply substituted cycloalkyl, uh, cycloalkane. So here's the Kekulé structure of this molecule. It's a cyclohexane, it's a six-membered ring. And the uh, bigger alkyl group is the ethyl group. So we number this starting at the ethyl group and going towards the rest of the substituents. So going towards the methyl group. 
So now we've got a one ethyl, uh, two methyl substituted compound, and it's a cyclohexane. So it's one ethyl, two methyl cyclohexane. Okay, so here's a few more. The first one we got here is a uh, cyclopropyl group. Um, this is um, three member ring, so cyclopropyl, and it has a methyl group attached to it, so it's just uh, methyl cyclopropane. Um, so there we go, methyl cyclopropane. The next one, we've got a six carbon ring system, so it's a cyclohexane. We've got two methyl groups. Now, we're going to have to number this because if we've got two methyl groups, we could have one methyl group on this carbon and we could have another methyl group on a different carbon. So dimethyl cyclohexane doesn't tell us which uh, positions those methyl groups are on. So when we number, when we name this compound, we need numbers. It's a 1,1 dimethyl cyclohexane. And notice when we add substituents before the, uh, the stem of the name, there's no gap and there's no hyphen or anything like that. It's just the substituents run into the stem in one foul swoop. Next one, five member ring with two methyl groups. Now the two methyl groups are on the one position and the two position, and so this is one, two dimethyl cyclopentane. And finally, we've got um, cyclo, um, a cyclopropyl group, but now this is going to be a bit odd to number this because we've got the group is attached to the middle of this alkyl chain. It's a lot easier to name this if we treat the stem as the alkyl chain, so it's a pentane with a cyclopropyl group attached to the three position of that chain. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit more background about cycloalkanes and how to name them. Thanks for watching.